Good afternoon, everybody. Um, some of you I know well and some of you I don't. And I know there are people from, from Galway and from Cork and from the centre in Dublin as well. Uh, you're all very welcome here today, and I'm delighted to see there's so many people here. I think that looking at the programme, I asked Mark and I, through the committee, what could I sort of type of information could I try to provide for, for you here today and us as a group. And uh, what I came up with was um, a title that was so, sort of some frequently asked questions. So the questions that sometimes patients and relatives ask me and the multidisciplinary group at our um, consultation or after the, the tumour meetings that we have, the tumour board meetings or the multidisciplinary meetings. And I know that you've had a, a surgical perspective and I know that Per won't give you just a surgical perspective because he's a very accomplished all-round individual bringing the experience from Uppsala as well. And it may also sort of provide a plan for the question that goes um, um, after that. Um, uh, oh yeah. So uh, I'd say that there's some, see the sort of questions that we get asked and then there's some misunderstandings or, or perceptions. So it's, um, it's um, one, of the f one of the most frequent questions, I think the most frequent question is, and it's not just with neuroendocrine tumors, but um, has the tumor been there long? That's a, that's a question many of you have asked of the person looking after you. Uh, is the tumor a real cancer? Uh, what makes a net, a neuroendocrine tumor, we use net obviously, or neuroendocrine neoplasm now, as I'll mention in a minute, different from other cancers? Uh, why is no treatment necessary get, given that this tumor is present? Is asked. Is chemotherapy not the best way to deal with this tumor? And there are many questions that remain unanswered. So there's a lot of patients and, 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 and carers and relatives and they want to know more about things. What's going to happen down the road? And there are fears, of course, in any type of thing. And of course, we can try as a group to try to help you with those, some of those questions later on if that's, if, that's, if, that's, if that's specific. So what is an endocrine tumor then is, um, I may have touched on this, but basically, um, we have a thing called the diffuse endocrine system. Now, this is not complex, it's not difficult for, for you to understand, it's just that endocrine cells exist throughout the entire body, but they're concentrated in a number of areas. The head is one, but especially in the gut, in the small intestine, in the stomach, the large intestine, and in the, in the rectum, and in the pancreas as well. So there's a number of different cell types in the pancreas that can uh, uh, develop into um, neuroendocrine tumors. And um, they, it's called neuroendo because there's similarities with uh, uh, the neural crest. And, and, and what, when we look down a microscope, there's some similar features. It's not necessarily a, a neural origin, but there are some similarities. And that sort of name stuck, even though they're endocrine tumors, not, not neural tumors, but they're endocrine tumors. But anyway, that's just to, to explain the origin of what, what it is. And they're characterized, by and large, by two things. Number one, they're supposed to be rare, but your presence here today tells me differently. And it's just the opportunity to say that they're rare in terms of we don't see that many new patients per year, but we see all of you back frequently. So that's what we call the prevalence. So the prevalence is quite high because they're slow growing. And they don't, like other cancers, um, result in, 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 in rapid progression and death as some other cancers do. So people are well, and that can be one of the difficulties, of course, is living for a long time with a tumor. However, some patients also have fairly aggressive um, uh, tumors as well, so it's not to underestimate that. But the majority are, in fact, um, slow growing, which is, which, is, which is a very good thing, of course. About a third of them come from the lung. Um, Roughly speaking, maybe 20%, I'll just put down a third. Um, so that's uh, fairly high. Uh, the vast majority of them in the lung are, they're, they're easy to deal with because they're very, uh, we call indolent or slow growing, and once you remove it, it's fine. And then another two thirds approximately comes from the stomach or the pancreas, from the gut basically, uh, uh, small intestine, etc. So that's really the breakdown. So is the tumor then a real cancer is what sometimes is asked. And I think the answer is yes and no. It's, it's real in that it's a, a concentration of cells that are dividing a little bit faster than your normal tissue would or should do. 
Um, all of your cells, in fact, will divide your skin and your small intestine, your stomach. Uh, its cells slough off and you get regrowth of other cells, etc. But sometimes then these cells will start to grow and they don't move out. So they're, not, they're not eliminated and they just becomes a little bit uncontrolled and you get a concentration of very small cells slowly growing that group together and it becomes a small tumor. Um, when you get a collection then um, becomes a tumor or a neoplasm. A neoplasm is in fact probably the term that's preferred uh, by the community now of neuroendocrine experts because it brings together tumors that are benign and tumors that are malignant, okay? Now they're two different entities and benigns are usually small lesions that are contained within a single organ, for example, in the pancreas, and we're seeing more and more often now small little lesions in the pancreas that are, we call, incidentally discovered. So we see it on a, on a scan that's done for, uh, you know, urinary symptoms or something like that, just completely found by accident. And uh, they, put, they, can, they can certainly pose um, uh, different challenges, but they can be completely benign, it's reassuring. And then the malignant ones usually then are larger, but some of them can be very small and have uh, uh, sites that are involved beyond the organ itself. So in other words, a, a little small ditzel in the, in the small intestine could be responsible for lymph nodes that are in the, the area around the small intestine or the supporting network, we call that the mesentery and you can have lymph nodes, or you could have liver lesions, like the testes to the liver. Um, the proliferation is usually slow, as I mentioned, and they can grow for many, many years. And they can grow for a long, long time, and by the time that we discover somebody in our clinic, or you've got specific symptoms that have been linked in, and we make the diagnosis, it's usually been there for many, many years, okay, for the vast majority of patients. Um, so, um, and even, I think it's important to say, even if you don't treat a lot of patients, the natural history we call that, is very slow. But our whole objective by seeing you as early as we can and starting treatment is to alter that natural history. Even if it is slow, slow growing, to try to influence that, it's important and we know that it's beneficial to do that now. It's quite clear. It's also important to say that there is a wide variety. So I may see, this week I saw two patients with gastric neuroendocrine tumors that were benign in the stomach. They don't need any surgical resection of that tumor. They're just followed up, surveyed, could be every two years, very small lesions. The same with small tumors of the rectum that need local excision only and they don't have metastasis and they never have metastasis and that's a very one end of the spectrum, which is very, very, obviously very good. And then we've got another end of the spectrum, and some patients present with very aggressive tumors at the start, okay? And in between then, most of the patients we see at our clinics are patients with what we call intermediate or tumors that can sometimes be a little bit advanced, but uh, that are still slowly growing. And uh, so there is quite a, 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 wide, a wide spectrum. Another question is, well, that I would ask, and I, was, I think this information is important, how do you know if it's aggressive or not? And we have simple measures for that, and uh, simple measures I think that you can understand. It's the general health of our, of our patients and um, the tumor aspect, then we look on down the microscope. We can, we can get an idea and look at the tumor grade, how aggressive the tumor looks. And we've got measures of, they're not, 100% uh, specific, but they're reasonably good. We can actually measure how fast the tumor is turning over or how it's proliferating, we call that. And that is important in choosing therapies. And we you know some of you here will have tumors involving the stomach perhaps, or the small intestine, or the pancreas, or the, or the colon, or, 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 or other organs, or the, or the bronchial tree. And you can see already that you've got tumors that are coming from different organs, so there's a quite variety. And then you'll also get tumors that are more aggressive in terms of how the tumor turns over and not. So we've got a lot of different factors to take into consideration in choosing therapy. But one of the important things is the actual grade, how fast the tumor is proliferating. Has it been there long? I already said that. But I just want to come back to the 
to the point that we are finding more and more small lesions, and sometimes larger lesions as well, that are found by accident, incidentally. And um, they do pose a particular challenge because you can imagine that if somebody at the age of 30 years of age had a small little lesion in the pancreas, very small, and it's completely benign, and somebody was 80 or 85 years of age, and we, we, we happen upon the same thing, there is a, you know, a, 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 there, there, there's, there's a, there's, there are patient factors that come into, the, into consideration. So somebody very young, you may say that, well, they've got you know, 60 years ahead of them or 70 years, whatever, that taking that out would seem to be a reasonable option, whereas somebody who's completely asymptomatic with a small lesion in the pancreas, uh, it may be a bit risky to do that surgery or if the patient's perfectly well. So some people will have what we call surveillance strategies and even with very small uh, little tumors as well. So again, that that's another little element. So the therapies now has been dealt with already this morning, but again, that's, that varies from nothing uh, at all, just what we call sometimes a wait and see if somebody's really, really well, and we want to see how fast a tumor is growing. We may bring the patient back in a couple of months to see, do a CT scan or something like that to see, is the lesion progressing before starting therapy? And because it's slow growing, we usually like to get a handle on that, but now I think it's fair to say that we are reluctant to do nothing for the vast majority of patients. We usually sort of think about at least giving patients injections of somatostatin analogs, which you've heard about this morning as well, uh, and, um, and then sometimes then other forms of therapy are, 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 are important. We always ask the question, I think it's fair to say, of our surgeons all the time uh, when we happen across a tumor, make a diagnosis, even if there are lesions in the liver, is it possible to perform a resection? Is it possible to cure the patient by taking out uh, the tumor? And sometimes uh, the types of surgical resections are complex, and that's why we've got people who are um, specialized in that area and who are, you know, liver surgeons as well as small intestinal surgeons and pancreatic surgeons. So it's, um, it can be challenging technically, but it's always worth asking the question, and, ma and many of you here may have had on one occasion, or perhaps even we call it two-step surgery on a couple of occasions, and uh, when it's possible, we, we do that. And sometimes we even do surgery, even though some people will have recurrent disease maybe in three to five years, but that's important as well because we can try to control it. So it's a controlling uh, mechanism as well. So for the slow-growing tumors, somatostatin analog therapy has been shown to be effective, and I'll come back to that very briefly. For tumors that are a little bit more aggressive, and depending on where they come from, uh, we can also entertain the idea of giving people either oral chemotherapy or intravenous chemotherapy, more classical chemotherapy. Um, however, the chemotherapy is not usually recommended for patients who have got classical, let's say, carcinoid syndrome, the patients who have got tumors coming from the small intestine with let's say, lesions in the liver as well, and the carcinoid syndrome with flushing, et cetera. Because we know that looking back at the trials that have gone on over the number of years, the uh, results of the chemotherapy has been a little bit disappointing. But there has been a lot of recent interest in newer agents that are given by mouth, the orally delivered agents, that have showed better results, and there are a few interesting clinical trials ongoing with that, and there's a lot of work in that area. Some of you will have an endocrine tumor, a neuroendocrine tumor, that causes flushing and diarrhea, and sometimes a little bit of breathing the difficulties called carcinoid syndrome. Okay, some of you have that. In fact, some of you don't, and the majority of patients with neuroendocrine tumors don't have that syndrome. But if you have that syndrome and you undergo surgery, you can have an excess liberation of those hormones and substances that cause the flushing and the diarrhea. And it could cause alteration in your blood pressure and other things. And it can cause what we call a crisis, okay? That you would be, you know, um, extremely unwell. And under those circumstances, if, depending on the type of procedure that you're going to have, one of them, for example, would be chemoembolization, Or if you're going to have surgery on your liver or on your primary tumor, let's say, that it was involving the intestine, we recommend then having a thing called prophylactic treatment with those sandostatin therapies that, you, that, that some of you receive. But instead of getting a monthly injection in, in the bottom, what you would get it is an, an intra intravenous infusion, okay? 
And the anesthetist who would be putting you to sleep, would, this would be started. And if you had any problems during the procedure, they can increase or decrease the dose of that to make sure that you're, you're well during the procedure and, and after the procedure as well. So um, that's important. And so Mark's initiative was very, very good. And, and we're looking at if patients are at risk with a neuroendocrine tumor and have carcinoid syndrome then. And on the card that uh, we will give you in the clinical situation, but on the card is the actual dose and the regimen that's prescribed for the procedure during, uh, before, during, and after. So uh, thanks a lot for that initiative. I think we just have to get uh, just some slight alterations to the wording and make sure that, that everybody's in agreement with that. But it's very important to state again that it's only pertinent if uh, you've got what we call carcinoid syndrome. There's no point in everybody being treated with these uh, substances because, um, y it, it, especially if you don't need it. This is sort of what's available. There's a lot more available. So I put down surgery in a big block. It's, it's the first question we ask. And you know, a lot of patients can be cured. A patient with small little tumor of the appendix, for example, you resect them, the vast, vast, vast majority of patients are cured, okay? And that's great, the same with gastric lesions or rectal lesions, et cetera. So surgery. We've got local regional treatment. I think, Per, you spoke about that this morning a little bit. You touched on it, chemoembolization for the liver. You've got um, peptide receptor radiated nuclei therapy or the therapy that some people have got in Uppsala or in Rotterdam, for example, here. Classical chemotherapy with newer agents that I've mentioned. And then we've got other things that, I d but anyway, there are various different novel agents that are acting on various parts of the mechanism that the tumor is actually getting bigger. So it's, um, it's a complex area, but fortunately we've got more um, and better agents available to us. I won't go on that, but the surgery basically from a medical, I'm a physician, so you know, it's complex. Curative resection I've mentioned, but we also do surgery to get rid of the primary tumor, even though sometimes patients have disease in the liver. Why do we do that? So that you don't run into problems with mechanical obstruction down the road. Sometimes that concept is hard not only to, to explain to you, but to explain to our own the community, the medical community. It's not always that easy. And it may also allow us to focus our attention on disease in a specific area. Like if we got rid of the small intestinal lesion with some of the lymph nodes that are there, and everything that was left was in the liver, we can think about doing other things for the liver, like chemoembolization or or, or, or injecting with other types of therapy or, or even surgery. We also do it to treat complications such as mechanical obstruction. And that happens, uh, especially with patients who've got lesions in, involving the, the small intestine. And sometimes, uh, occasionally, especially in patients with a lot of functional symptoms, that patients who've got, for example, very high insulin secretion, which gives you uncontrollable symptoms and even though we can't get rid of all of the tumor, we might try to resect almost all of the tumor uh, to uh, control symptoms. And that sometimes um, is, it's, it's not that often, but it's sometimes, we call that debulking surgery. Smart statin analogs, basically there are a few available. The ones we frequently use are sandostatin and anuretide. So you get it every a monthly injection. Sometimes people need to have daily injections to start off with, and then we get to a dose that we can work out um, what dose you need. Both of them are effective for pancreatic intestinal tumors, and that's a take-home message. We know now that both of these agents control your tumors that are proliferating inside, okay? And that's been uh, recently confirmed in a, in, a, in a study that was presented at a meeting in, in late September of this year with lanreotide. Somatostatin is a naturally occurring hormone or, or protein, we call it a peptide, it's secreted by the hypothalamus, and it has a number of important actions in all of healthy individuals. Um, the, the therapy with the radioactive substances then, they haven't been tested in what we call a phase three trial or, or, or a comparative trial, but there's one certainly in progress and it's recruiting a, a lot of patients and we'll have better answers in a fairly short space of time. But we know from a number of what we call good quality phase two trials that this therapy is very useful. And we can use either two substances, lutetium, yttrium, and they're linked to this somatostatin. There's another form of therapy that's radioembolization. It's a little bit like chemoembolization that I mentioned now. And we use radioactive substances that are, that are directed into the liver. 
um, to alter the blood supply and to, and to destroy the tumors. And what we do is we can send off little beads that are going to slow down the blood supply to the, um, to the lesion itself. And that will cause a decrease in the nutrient supply to the, to the, to the tumor itself. And in chemotherapy then, just as, just as an overview, we use these especially for patients with pancreatic tumors. We know that they're very chemosensitive. And we can give it either intravenously or orally, up to three to six months. We usually do the evaluation at about that time. So we need to have had a number of courses of chemotherapy before we can actually give a judgment of how it's working. Um, that can vary though. And we have a few agents that are new that have been tested in very, what we call, stringent circumstances in big clinical trials. They've been compared to standards of therapy and they've been shown to be beneficial, Everolimus and Sinitinib. These are drugs, some of you may be on these drugs, and um, they have been tested. And I think the, the point I wanted to make is that now, using um, groups that are very active and communicating with each other, we can manage to put patients in the clinical trials to ask and try to answer some very uh, important questions about therapy, but also sometimes about diagnostics and how we can make progress for you, and that's what it's all about. So as you know, the, um, the Irish Neuroendocrine Tumor uh, Group uh, was recognized, got recognized from the, um, the um, NCCP, and I think um, thanks to Dr. Sudan O'Reilly, who has been very positive and very involved and uh, with uh, both the patient group and, uh, and with our group as well, we were able to move that on a little bit. It's been good cooperation. So uh, I was granted permission to go from St. James's Hospital where I worked to St. Vincent's and I link in with Donald O'Shea, who led the and leads the uh, group at St. Vincent's Hospital with Justin Gagan and a number of other people. Uh, and uh, we also, um, as part of our uh, group, have uh, the uh, Cork uh, group uh, involved, and that's um, with Derek Power, uh, who is a cancer specialist and oncologist, uh, who's leading the Cork group in, com in conjunction with Christor O'Sullivan. Uh, and um, they've got a multidisciplinary group who's looking after patients with neuroendocrine tumors, and also we have, in Galway, uh, uh, Dr. Greg Leonard with Marcia Bell, who's an endocrinologist, and they've got a multidisciplinary group as well. And so we got together this morning to um, sit down and see how we can make further progress and advance things along. And uh, our objectives really were to concentrate uh, the energy uh, to help us to improve and provide a better service, uh, to streamline the what we call the diagnostic area of things, and to provide. Uh, therapy that's uh, according to the best international standards and, uh, and to also to educate the not only the younger people but the but the older people around that but to basically to provide a, a a quality service for 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 all of you here and your and your relatives um, there's a recognized Lee that's me for the for the, for the moment um, and we have um, we have now I think in the three sites we've got a dedicated net consultation service so certainly in in Vincent's, we have now, after our multidisciplinary meetings, we have a, a neuroendocrine tumor clinic where we see the patient. We try to see them as soon as possible after the discussion that we've had. Now, there's a little bit of tweaking and streamlining of that to go, but it's, it's, been, it's been well, for, for those who benefited from that, it's been, it's been well accepted. Um, our consultation service is a multidisciplinary one, so that if a patient needs to see me or Donal as a medical decision, and for example, uh, there's a question of whether we need to do some surgery as well. It's great that we can have, we can have Mr. Justin Gagan there, or a colleague, Mr. Amir Hoti, for the moment. We have a surgeon that's there, and it's a multidisciplinary service that we can, that we can provide, and that hopefully saves people time coming back and forth. Um, not easy to set that up, and I'm grateful to Justin and to Amir uh, for making themselves available at that time. and. Uh, but that's worked out extremely well. And I, I mean, I've had very good positive feedback from that, being able to. And you know, sometimes we can't do surgery on, uh, for a certain reason, but it's great that we're able to go through and have that discussion with somebody physically present. And the same, um, uh, same applies for, um, uh, for Greg and for, uh, and for Cork as well, with Derek and with, uh, with Chris Tor, which is, um, which, which I think is, a, which will be a big advance, of course. And then, we were looking also then at registry of patients, getting the data in an anonymized fashion, obviously, to try to get as much 
pertinent information about you. This helps us an awful lot. And we have a, 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 a program to have a common multidisciplinary or a, or a national multidisciplinary meeting where we discuss uh, everything together so that, you know, um, I, we can present a case and if, if Christopher Sodawan, for example, has got an input uh, to say in that or his, his experience that we can share the expertise among a chosen group or a network of people who are dedicated to, uh, to this area. Um, this is the group that I've been uh, attached to and I think that we were basically mother or trying to, to uh, base our, our, our decisions largely on, on uh, European guidelines. I think they're definitely I don't think they are the best guidelines um, in the world. We have a number of people in the Irish group that have been involved in this um, European Euro and Consumer Group. Uh, and we have uh, guidelines that are updated every year. Uh, and uh, they're available to us. And uh, we're involved in the committee as well. So educational measures and diagnosis and therapies and standards of care, promoting clinical trials then, and uh, creating then cent centers of excellence. So. We are, as an Irish group, very much sort of following the same pattern of our European colleagues and partners, such as one uh, in, uh, in Uppsala or in Rotterdam or other places, perhaps, that some of you have been as well. But there's a big, big, big collection of European groups that are either centers of excellence or borderline centers of excellence. And this is something that's becoming more and more prevalent. And it's um, fortunately providing us with a much stronger platform to, uh, to make progress in this area. So I think that's all. Um, I have to say. <laughs>